All right. Welcome, everybody. And thank you for if you missed last week and you would like to see last week's, you can always email me if you didn't get uh, signed up in time. But I, I hope this is not your first time either on our, on our lecture series or this four week uh, uh, series on conservation in Louisiana. Um, last week, we had uh, a lecture uh, on E.A. McElhaney and his relationship to conservation. And then today, uh, we're going to be having uh, a talk on Caroline Dormans. Our speaker again is Dr. Jacob Gotro. He uh, is, is a professor at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. And I will mention also, if you do have questions, please, you put them in the chat, chat as we go along uh, and we'll ask them at the end. But also um, just a reminder that next, the next two that Jacob's going to be doing are going to be on Monday, the next two Mondays. Uh, he had a class schedule thing work out, so we just moved it to the day before. So we're uh, happy that we're still able to do it. So with that, I want to welcome Jacob and uh, and week two. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for that introduction. Um, if if any of you can't hear me, please just jump on and let me uh, know. You're good. To, I can hear you great. OK, great. OK, so um, as as the introduction said, I'll be talking about Caroline uh, Dorman tonight. So I'm, I might as well go ahead and get started. But. Caroline Dorman, uh, more aptly titled The Woods Nymph or Louisiana's own Thoreau, uh, was raised with the expectation that she would fulfill the role of a traditional Southern aristocratic woman. Her family on her mother's side moved to Louisiana from South Carolina in 1859, reportedly in search of fertile soil for cotton growing as the local dirt in South Carolina was exhausted. The family purchased a cotton plantation on the edge of the Red River Valley in Briarwood, Louisiana, and at some point also acquired a main home in the North Louisiana town of Arcadia. Born in 1889 at the home in Arcadia, Caroline was raised in the ways of a proper North Louisiana woman, which included not only lessons on etiquette, but also respect for the surrounding woods and animals. Her love of the woods grew from frequent hunting trips in the accompaniment of her attorney father, James L. Dorman. However, unlike her father, Caroline preferred to observe and capture the flora and fauna with paint and pencil. Her childhood love of nature was given academic training when she attended the College of Education in Marion, Alabama, and obtained a degree in art and literature in 1907. After graduating, she was certified to teach in Louisiana, eventually making her way to the southwestern Louisiana town of Lake Charles by 1916. However, after a few years there, uh, she requested to be moved closer to her home due to constant illness, which she thought the result of the balmy climate. Her request was granted in 1918, and she was transferred to the small town of Kasachi in central Louisiana. A car was unavailable for her, and the only accessible transport for her journey was reportedly a slow moving wagon drawn by oxen. Here in a caravan of cattle, she first witnessed the beauty of the remaining old growth pine forest in what was titled the Kasachi Wold, or an area of forested hills and rocky outlooks in the northwestern part of central Louisiana. Over time, her continued exploration and amazement of the surroundings convinced her to take on the animating goal to preserve the, quote, unspoiled beauty. Caroline Dorman's endeavors relate local efforts to the culmination of national forest policy and management to that point. By 1919, she had permanently moved to teach in Kasachi while also making frequent trips to her parents' home in Briarwood. The surrounding forest tapestry motivated her early uncoordinate, uncoordinated efforts to institute forestry education within the school settings in her own classroom. In 1920, thanks to the overwhelmingly positive response to her efforts, she was invited to a conference of the Southern Forestry Association in New Orleans, where she met Henry S. Graves, then director of the United States Department of Forestry and direct successor to Gifford Pinchot, among other longing interests such as Henry Hartner, and Hartner is pictured on the screen. Hartner was the son of a German immigrant who purchased land near Urania in north central Louisiana. He introduced the first successful and measured technique of southern pine reforestation on his tract of lumber land. Now, as a lumber baron, Hartner was just as guilty as any other capitalist of placing human bodies below profit margins. 
Industrial logging presented extreme dangers to workers evidenced by the endless and gruesome injury reports in the archives of corporate logging interests. However, Hartner differed from most major industrial logging concerns through its efforts of reforestation and forest management that arguably have a socially regenerative aspect. Unlike the ghost towns and devastated forests that followed the cut and get out mentality of most logging operations, reforestation offers a means of managing a renewable and harvestable forest. This approach, at least on the surface, promises longer lasting employment uh, for the locals related to forestry. It was at this meeting in New Orleans that Dorman first petitioned Graves and Hartner, among other logging interests, to create a national forest in Louisiana that, that would preserve the native longleaf and shortleaf pine. Here, Dorman emerged as a leading spokesperson for national forests in both the nation and locally. However, an under-examined element of her campaign revolved around her status, partially as a result of her family plantation interests, as a proper Southern lady. For some, conservation efforts in the South embodied an effort by former conservative upper-class patrician interests in reaction to the supposed exploitative invasion of Northern industry. Many references to the mythic lost cause of the Confederacy and supposed static of the moonlights and magnolias of the Old South are found in the naming practices of plant and flower societies, of which Miss Dorman was a member of many. Think of Confederate Jasmine pictured on the screen, or the Alexander Mouton Camellia named for the Confederate general and post-war regulator from the Southwest Louisiana town of Vermilionville, now known as Lafayette. However, forestry, among other extractive industries in Louisiana at the turn of the 20th century, the turn of the 20th century was dominated by Northern interests. Reforestation programs offered a measure of home rule as forest commodities were pliable products for manufacturing and lumber interests to profit upon. Cries of monopoly and exploitative practices are often associated with the Louisiana branch of the Standard Oil Company, the sworn enemy of rising politician and in 1921, public utilities commissioner Huey Long. However, the first true industry based on massive natural resource extraction was lumber. Hence the 1904 creation of the Moribound Louisiana Forestry Commission and the formation of the Department of Forestry as a subsidiary to the larger Department of Conservation in 1910. Despite the creation of these departments over the next decade, remaining tracts of forested land were harvested at an ever more frantic pace, thus the need for action by the conference in New Orleans in 1920. Long's strongest political support originated from those regions most devastated by industrial logging. Although conservation efforts may have provided ecological relief to such denuded regions, the populist message of natural resource development for local benefit often put such programs at odds with conservationists such as Caroline Dorman. However, the Long and Dorman family feud may have had longer local underpinnings. Although scholars do not know the exact origins of the feud between the Long and Dorman families, one can follow the examples of preceding scholars such as T. Harry Williams to quote, weigh the scales of evidence and draw a conclusion. The Dorman family home rested in the parish of Bienville, just to the north and west of Wynn Parish. The home of the Long family in north central Louisiana, both sat on the edges of the fertile Red River Valley. Dorman's family relations on her mother's side moved to Louisiana from a barren region of South Carolina in the hopes of starting a cotton plantation. Long, on the other hand, descended from a somewhat small landowning family that owned slaves prior to the Civil War. Caroline Dorman's mother, Caroline Trotty Sweat Dorman, was herself a newspaper columnist and the author of Under the Magnolias. Dorman's family, Southern aristocratic cotton planting interests, arguably positioned themselves in opposition to the populist agenda of the 1890s. Populism experienced an upsurge in support not just in the South, but also in the West. And the formation of the People's Party in 1892 represented uh, kind of the, the comeuppance of populism. 
This political coalition still marks the strongest third party challenge to the traditional two party political system in American political history. Although, although the failure of that coalition between, uh, uh, although the failure of the coalition between the National People's Party and Democrats in the 1896 campaign to elect William Jennings Bryan generally marks the end of national populism, populist inspired messaging remained a constant in Wynn Parish, where socialism enjoyed strong support in the early 1900s. However, another massive political force in the area to continue to contend with was the Ku Klux Klan. Although the original Klan had emerged in the 1860s as a response to Reconstruction, the organization experienced a rebirth in the 19-teens with the ascendance of the Southerner Woodrow Wilson to the White House and a new focus on anti-immigration. Dorman's father, reportedly a member of the local chapter of the KKK, may have presented challenges to the populist messaging of Long's father, Hugh P. Long. Hugh was a remarkably unsuccessful politician who used some populist and socialist-inspired rhetoric in his political messaging for local wind parish political offices in the early 1900s. And despite the story of a poor upbringing that Huey loved to tout in his political speeches, Hare makes clear that during his childhood, the Long family was actually one of the wealthiest in Wynn Parish. Hugh had acquired vast amounts of land, which skyrocketed in value after the construction of a railroad stop in the town of Winfield in the 1890s. The Longs were recent grantees of immense economic status, despite descending from small land-owning farmers. Although the family fortune had declined by 1910, perhaps it is here in the backgrounds of the status of each family that a feud emerged. A much more immediate cause for Dorman and Long family strife may be the efforts of Caroline and her family to establish a national forest in the state. After the 1920 Southern Forestry Conference, Dorman was hired by the State Department of Forestry as supervisor of education. The first female hired to the department within the state and possibly to forestry as a profession nationally, Dorman would go on to fill the role of forestry conservation educator, reenacting her previous role as a teacher, only this time her lessons were of proper respect for nature and conservation of natural resources. She also advocated for reforestation and the establishment of a national forest within the state. When no national forest was established by 1922, Dorman investigated and uncovered the reasons as to why. The state had no enabling act, which would allow the national government to purchase the necessary tracts of timber land in the hopes of preservation or conservation of resources. Dorman enlisted her attorney brother Ben to write an enabling act, which would grant the necessary powers to the federal government. And in the meantime, she petitioned powerful lumber interests within the state to donate tracts of land for the eventual establishment of a national forest. Such efforts eventually led to the establishment of Kasachi National Forest in 1930. To this day, the only national forest land contained within the bounds of Louisiana and available to citizens as a public commons. Long, who partially got his start as an attorney representing injured lumber mill workers, may have found the entire Department of Conservation, of which the Department of Forestry was, was a subsidiary, a disgusting reminder of the conservative power hierarchy that had ruled Louisiana since 1877. It is also possible that he saw the establishment of Kasachi as an overreach of federal authority in local politics. Neither is certain. However, what is true is that although Dorman resigned from the Department of Forestry in 1923 due to conflicts with her direct supervisor, she returned in 1927 to resume her role as an ecological educator. However, with the ascendance of Long to power in 1928 and a lawsuit brought down on the governor's ability to fire Department of Conservation employees, uh, essentially it, it, it went against the Department of Conservation. And although it took some time, by November of 1929, the courts ruled on the side of Long that he was able to fire employees who did not declare their immediate loyalty. Dorman resigned before being fired, stating simply that, quote, when Huey Long was elected governor, 
I again resigned my position within the Department of Conservation. Here marks a period of transition in the personal activities of Dorman. Coincidentally, Dorman also entered into a long-standing conversation with John Swan, longtime employee of the Bureau of American Ethnology within the Smithsonian Institution at Washington, D.C. The Bureau was created as part of an effort to preserve the, quote, anthropologic research of North America, which falls within a larger search for American identity, which consumed many academics at the end of the 1800s. The Bureau of Ethnology attempted to preserve records of Native American culture in North America reflected in the name change to the Bureau of American Ethnology. Here, Swanton made a name for himself as director of the BAE with a specialty in the natives of Southeast North America along with the Pacific Northwest. Dorman was infused with interest in Native Americans by her father. And during her time touring the state in the employ of the State Department of Forestry, she also acquired expert knowledge of local native mounds and culture. It is this role that brought Swanton into contact with Dorman, who she reached out to to provide academic publications on local native groups. However, an underexamined element of their conversations is Swanton's outside perspective on local political development. After Long's election in 1928, he moved to consolidate his control of state politics. Unintentionally, this is also the time that Dorman and Swanton's conversations start, started. Dorman first wrote to Swanton in May of 1929 to obtain information on the primitive people of the state. As previously mentioned, by November of that year, Caroline resigned her post within the Department of Con Conservation, stating in confidence that she was, quote, bitterly opposed to his, meaning Long's, politics. Over the next few years, Dorman focused on her own writing while also discussing the travel route of Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto, a central focus in the search for American identity with Dr. Swanton, as they both suspected that the journals of the initial expedition were some of the earliest descriptions of Southeastern native groups. In the meantime, Long managed to consolidate his hold on state politics. In 1930, he ran and won the senatorial election but refused his seat until he could place his loyal supplicant, Oscar K. Allen, in the role of governor. Once assured that the state would remain under his sway, Long exited for a short period and traveled to Washington to take up his seat. In letters written in January of 1932, Swanton mentions Long's first introduction to his seat as senator. By March, Long was, Long was making a name for himself by attacking the head of the Democratic Party, Arkansas Senator Joe Robinson, although Swanton referred to him as providing amusement rather than wrath. The emotion changed from amusement to anger by early 1933, when the methods by which Long established his home rule were obvious even to an outside audience. Swanton speculated that, quote, the political methods of your friend, the senator, seem to be getting all the air just now. He added later in that year, don't you think Senator Long in bronze is highly appropriate? In August of 1934, he referenced the hot temperatures in Washington, D.C. as a possible salve to Long's ongoing feud with the mayor of New Orleans, T. Sims Walmsley. Swanton humorously referred to the sweltering climate by stating that, quote, if Louisiana has a temperature anything like ours, I wonder that the long Walmsley war, war can be conducted with such ferocity. As between the state boss, meaning long, and the city boss, meaning Walmsley, I should suppose the honest people of Louisiana would have difficulty in knowing what to do. Perhaps they will kindly destroy each other. By 1935, Long was making a national name for himself by introducing his controversial Share Our Wealth program. In short, the program aimed to tax anyone making over $1 million a year at a progressively higher tax rate for each additional million that they made and to take away any fortune exceeding $10 million. His impact was noticeable even in Washington, D.C., where Swanton recalled that copies of his autobiography Every man a king were in a store window on my way to and from lunch. He added that I notice he does not say every man a king fish. 
Continuing, he admitted that the senator from Louisiana does have the most devilish ingenuity in reading his different audiences and adapting himself to them. But it will be rather a fascism than a democracy without, however, using the name. Long's death at the hands of an assassin in September of that year created a sigh of relief among his many opponents. And so just to make the point uh, that such feelings were not isolated to Dorman and Swanton, I like to pull uh, this letter out and I like to pull out the quote uh, from this letter. And this letter is written to a well-known upper-class citizen of Louisiana, of which we are all familiar with, um, that I'll mention in a slide or two uh, down in the lecture. Um, but it is referencing Huey's grasp of power as follows. No political boss in America has dared even to hint at the things that Huey actually does. I sometimes think the world is going crazy. Mussolini, Hitler, Huey. Part of the larger national picture that added to the luster of Huey P. Long's social programs was the economic and social happenstance during the 1930s. The Great Depression starting in the late 1920s, along with the environmental disaster of the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, drove the country towards unprecedented action. As Long rose to power in the state after 1928, his approach to governance as one of active social spending and improvement through increasingly centralized government power enthralled the masses while frightening traditional conservative interests. However, even traditionalists such as Dorman admitted that not all of Long's development programs were necessarily harmful to social development in the state. In fact, on multiple occasions, Dorman praised Long's road building program as a much needed development within the bounds of Louisiana. This brings up an interesting point when speaking on cultural preservationists in the 1930s. Although patronizing, preservationists did contribute to documentation of local folk. Partially as a response to the instability of the Great Depression, a larger search for American identity ensued, as evidenced by the search for the preservation of American Indian languages and oral traditions, a hot topic of conversation between Swanton and Dorman, along with their efforts to map the DeSoto expedition. During this time, Dorman also collected oral and written traditions on those she considered part of the, quote, folk of America. And this information would later serve as the basis for her fictional books on Southeastern Native Americans, local hill folk, and even some, albeit unpublished, stories on Acadian or Cajun tradition. Dorman was not alone in her venture as E.A. McElhinney published his own collection of African-American gospels entitled with the patronizing Before de War Spirituals in 1934. He also preserved the names and faces of individuals involved in the conservation of the natural world in such natural history-focused pieces as an alligator's life history. And I want to just say that presenting this publicly has actually enabled me uh, to identify at least one of these individuals on the screen uh, pictured here as Adam Alondo, who reportedly still has uh, family members living in Iberia Parish of where we think this photograph was uh, taken. And so the hope is to uh, conduct oral histories to see if we can bring to light uh, any more of his story and his involvement uh, with natural, uh, natural, con natural history conservation. Um, however, the young boy uh, also featured in the book remains unidentified, and I so I hope presenting this publicly uh, one day we can bring a name um, to the picture. But perhaps an article that McElhinney aimed to publish in the Princeton printed Journal of Heredity in 1934 best summarizes the motivation behind the efforts of cultural preservationists. Quote, as I have lived among the primitive races, as well as those half civilized, I have had an unusually good opportunity to form from actual observation, a comparison of the primitive stone age types with our highly artificial culture of today. Conservative cultural preservationists attempted to preserve quote culture as it represented a return to the primitive and in Dorman's case to the quote children of nature that many arguably envisioned disappearing before their eyes in the chaos of the great depression. Although patronizing, their efforts are commendable in the documentary trace left behind for the curious researcher. 
Huey's death in September of 1935 enabled Dorman to work her way back into state employment. A.R. Johnson, a long guide or a long supporter, but also reportedly a possible childhood friend of the Dorman family, hired her onto the state employment role in 1936 to serve as director of landscaping the state charity hospitals, another result of the long program. Johnson hired Dorman not only due to their previous possible personal relations, but also for her expert knowledge of local flora and fauna. Dorman immediately set out to instill a native flora landscape in the design of the state charity hospitals. Using her contacts throughout the state, she acquired various indigenous plantings for free. However, her effort to save the state money brought her into conflict with Longites at a meeting in, in Alexandria in 1938. The unidentified mob of supporters jeered her as she gave a public lecture. And although the exact reasoning remains unidentified, again, scales of evidence provide a logical narrative. Long supporters, arguably part of the network of tree nurseries established to the south of Alexandria and Forest Hill, were used to the system of state control of purchasing power, which benefited businesses through direct payment and under the table kickbacks. When Dorman did not participate in the graph, the supporters targeted her unmercifully. The ultimate irony is that when anti-long forces swept to power, in the aftermath of the Louisiana scandals in 1939, Dorman was fired from her state position. The advent of war in 1939 and eventual inclusion of the United States in 1941 brought even further transitions to the forests of Louisiana in the nation. War resources first ramped up to supply the European war effort, then to aid the buildup of American forces, outweighed any conservationist concerns. By 1942, Louisiana would host war maneuvers that physically transformed the landscape, as well as dynamically altered the social makeup of the state. Formerly insular communities, such as those called Cajun in Southern Louisiana, at that point in time, any poor French-speaking group within the Southern section of the state, along with the hill folks of Northern Louisiana and communities of African-Americans, Native Americans, and various minorities were exposed to and involved in the massive transformation of the state's physical and social geography. And so such a transformation directly after the efforts in the 1930s of cultural preservationists um, to preserve the culture of those they considered folk is all the more important to consider uh, when we consider this vast transformation that took place within the state in the decade immediately following. Caroline Dorman would go on to live at Briarwood for the rest of her life, passing in 1971. Living in solitude, however, did not mean she lived quietly, as she continued to write and wrote on many topics, um, such as the future of farm homesteads, the future of rural America, along with commenting on Rachel Carson's uh, publication of Silent Spring and the realization that pesticides uh, used to keep pests from eating agricultural products had the potential to le leach poisons into stomachs and possibly even affect future children. She was even consulted on civil rights as she maintained open communication with a leader in the Baton Rouge movement. However, plant life remained her area of expertise. Her particular, particular floral interests were widespread but was well known to have included irises, and she belonged to the State Iris Society of whose members touted themselves irisaics and networked many like-minded interests. And she was actually credited, uh, along with one of her counterparts, of breeding a new uh, species of iris uh, by crossing uh, various species together. Remaining on an expert, remaining an expert of plant life, on native plant life in particular, Dorman dedicated her property as a nature preserve, where since the land has served as a nursery for many rare species uh, from across the country. And today the site serves as a propagating center for Louisiana Tech's native plant breeding and propagation program. And so um, the efforts of Caroline Dorman and the efforts of similar uh, preservationists and conservationists um, should be remembered, and so we should um, you know, honor uh, such people as Caroline. 
for for time immemorial, to be honest. But thank you. That's the end of my uh, lecture for tonight. Great. We have time for questions. If you do have questions, I'm going to kick it off. Um, it's interesting. Usually when you have somebody that uh, I, I mean, her choice of, for the reason for, for to go to Louisiana Tech and to be a, um, a you know, a, a seed and, and, and a protection area is, is a, a great example. But it's surprising that it didn't go to like a state park or something like that. Was that ever considered or was she like basically I'm going to have try to have as much somewhat control or to give it to some a group that has more instead of you never know who's the politician that might be in charge. Um, so, yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, and I think I think it was definitely what you're hinting at it, that she wanted more control and more importantly, the caretaker, um, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaking his name, I think it's Richard Johnson. Um, she was personally a friend, kind of a, a mentor to him. And she put him in charge and left the uh, the property as a trust. And so there was this idea of kind of remaining in the control of the person that she left the property to and directly under his caretaking ability and kind of keeping that in that kind of personal family, almost uh, control or relation status. Gotcha. Um and if you do have questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. I'm willing to ask them. Or if you want to unmute yourself, you're welcome to do that. Um, today, is it, a, I mean, how active is that property through Louisiana Tech? And uh, is it a thriving uh, department for them, kind of? So it, it is still active. It's still a thriving department for their native uh, plant propagation um, program. Um, the last time I was there, so I admittedly haven't been there since the winter of 2021. So that's about a year and a half ago. Um, and the property had just been through a tornado, some storms. And so there was a lot of, you know, uh, trees down everywhere. And there was a lot of work that needed to be done. Um, but it sounded like there was still a lot of people very interested in the property. Um, there's a whole group that manages the property. And so it seemed like they were still very interested in keeping this as a nature preserve, but also having this this kind of active use that Louisiana Tech uses it for continue, continue onward. Well, she sounds like um, an unbelievable lady that uh, we'll learn, look forward to learning. You know, I mean, we you, you connected uh, last week to this week, uh, which I thought was a very interesting, uh, uh, I mean, an amazing letter to see that. And then uh, I'd love to see if he still thinks he, he was as bad as he was when you yeah. compare it to the other two a little bit later on, because it gets worse, much and worse. But uh, we've got a, a lecture next Monday. Um, can you do a little, in, you know, just a little, little bit about the whooping crane and uh, John Lynch's papers? Yeah, so this is going to focus on John Lynch, who was a biologist uh, that moved to Louisiana. Um, he, he was a migratory waterfowl biologist, but what he's most well known for is um, capturing the last whooping crane um, to attempt to preserve the species of which was down into the teens in the 1950s. And so he gets involved with that. They get involved with captive breeding program and happy to say it was successful because we now have over a thousand whooping cranes in the nation. So that's just a little preview of what I'll be talking about. Fantastic. Well, Jacob, I want to thank you so much for tonight. I hope to see everybody uh, again uh, on Monday of next week and we will learn about the whooping crane. And uh, if you're in New Orleans, I hope you're getting some of the rain that I am getting right now. So Jacob, thank you so much. And uh, Janelle says, thank you so much, Jacob. So absolutely. Thank you. We appreciate it. And we'll see you mo next Monday. And thank you all. Thank you.